Well, the problem seems to be that there's no consistency of approach to recycling. A typical reaction we got when we talked both to councils and the Chartered Institute of Waste Management was a sympathetic interest in the problem, but an admission that there wasn't any concerted policy about how to help visually impaired people. Well, Wayne Priestley is Principal Advisor on Environmental Matters at APSI, that's the Association of Public Service Excellence. And they advise local authorities on best practice. And Wayne it joins me in the studio. You've heard what those residents had to say and what was clear that they, they weren't indifferent to the issues. You know, they wanted to do it. They wanted more help so they could recycle efficiently. What would you say to them? What help should local authorities be able to offer them? I would say most local authorities probably, when they send out the information on recycling, are not aware that people have visual impairment so the first thing people need to do is notify the local authority of that situation because otherwise they will treat everybody you know the same and therefore the the information you get will be on paper it'll be on your bin which if you're visually impaired really isn't much use you see that isn't necessarily something that somebody would want to do you know visually impaired people don't go telling everybody that they are they'd hope to be able to move into a place and be I, i understand your point but it probably wouldn't come naturally to people to do that. No, and I appreciate that as well. But I think if they are struggling with that, any person would would get hold of the local authority. There was one instance where a gentleman there had had a sticker placed on his bin saying, you've got it wrong. That happens to everyone. And usually what happens is the local authority will send a recycling officer down to offer advice. Now, the the issue here is they've got to do that sensitively because people have got an impairment there, but they need help. And that is the best way to get the recycling done because then they can offer that help, whether it be assistance with collections, whether it be putting things on bins to make them more tactile, if you like, to understand what goes in those bins. And there are examples across the the country of that. Of course. I mean, there is that issue of which bin is which and colour isn't very helpful. But there's also the issue of what you're allowed to recycle and what you aren't. Ian gave the example of bottles, the actual plastic cover you can do but not the bottle tops for example there's a lot of that kind of thing isn't there yeah and i I think the problem with that is each local authority has its own arrangements to dispose or, or send for treatment the waste it collects and often the processing plants are different in each authority and you will get those that can handle that type of material and some that can't and there is therefore a need to speak to the producers of these materials and find out, can they make this packaging easier to recycle? What are the chances of of getting some kind of concerted policy? I appreciate that local authorities are all, you know, independent, they want to do things their own way, but this isn't really about doing it different ways, is it? It's about having agreed methods of labelling, it's about having perhaps agreed policies in terms of collection. Would that be too much to ask? Well, certainly I think the government's uh, developing a new waste strategy, which is looking at producers making materials which are far more recyclable and easier to recycle. And if that was the case, then it would make it far easier for local authorities to collect because the waste wouldn't be as complicated to collect and it would therefore be easier for people to know which bins to put waste in. But my point is you've got organisations like uh, the LGA, the Local Government Association, and yourselves... Is it beyond the wit of those organisations to have a concerted policy at least about things like identification? No, I don't think it's beyond that. And I think it's something that is being looked at. And particularly now that a lot of the waste that the UK, uh, recyclable waste that the UK used to send abroad to be processed, a lot of that now has been rejected by countries like China and other Southeast Asian countries. So therefore, the quality of recyclables has got to be better And the only way you can do that is to make it simpler to recycle. Wayne Priestley of the Association of Public Service Excellence. And one little tailpiece to that, we're hoping that this item will start conversations about this issue. And the Chartered Institute for Waste Management did tell us that they were hoping to start some work on the subject with other relevant organisations. Let's have your top tips for recycling, please. Sadly, it's a bit late now to get some top tips on painting and sculpting from Leonardo da Vinci, but the fact is that there is a strong possibility that despite 
his enormous artistic talent, Leonardo may well have been visually impaired. The evidence suggests that he had strabismus. That's an eye condition where the eyes aren't properly aligned. In other words, that he had a squint. But that far from being a disability for an artist, this might explain his rare ability to bring an impression of depth and distance to paintings on a flat canvas. It's a puzzle which Christopher Tyler, who's Professor of Optometry at London City University, has been determined to clear up. So the kind of business that he has seems to be intermittent exotropia. So the eyes are divergent, but in some portraits they're straight. So this suggests the condition of intermittent exotropia in which the person can straighten their eyes if they're very attentive, but if they are inattentive or relaxed, one eye will drift out. So these mean that the two eyes are not working well together, and in fact, this would would generate the impression of double vision. So the person would see everything double, and the brain deals with this by suppressing the image from one eye. So in that case, they're seeing with monocular vision. With monocular vision, everything looks much flatter. This may be an advantage for artists because they're trying to translate the three-dimensional world onto the flat canvas. On the other hand, the fact that the condition is intermittent means that people with this condition may be well aware of the sort of transition between three dimensions and two dimensions and give them an enhanced awareness of the cues, the painterly cues that convey a three-dimensional impression on the canvas. So you're saying that Leonardo da Vinci would have known, I mean, could tell that he had this condition, that he saw things differently to other people, and he was making use of this in his painting. The implication is that he was able to make use of it, and it could go part way to explain why he was so exquisitely sensitive to the three-dimensionality and was able to bring it out, unlike other artists of the era. Professor Christopher Tyler Well, other later famous painters may also have had this condition. Rembrandt, possibly Salvador Dali. And this isn't the only eye condition with which painters have struggled and sometimes enhanced their work. Ross King is the biographer of Claude Monet, who began losing his sight in later life. By 1912, when he was about 72 years old, he made the discovery that, um, as he put it, uh, he was blind. Um, In fact, he wasn't actually blind, um, but he was suffering from cataracts. Um, And in fact, he was soon after diagnosed as being legally blind in his right eye. And apparently he had only 10 percent vision in his left eye. Um, He was encouraged to have an operation or operations on each of his eyes at that point uh, so that he could see. But I think quite wisely, he decided that he would not. Uh, for the reason that there were all sorts of precedents uh, by 1912 um, of people who'd had cataract operations uh, that were unsuccessful. Uh, What's interesting about his situation is he resumed painting and began painting on a very ambitious scale uh, by 1914 and made no complaints about his eyesight until about 1920-21, when clearly his eyesight such as it was at that point, was getting worse. In in that period that you've just talked about, is there a difference in the way in which he painted than than he had before? After 1914, when he resumes painting after this diagnosis of cataracts two years earlier, is that he has supersized his canvases. He begins working not on canvases that are the size that he'd worked on for decades previously, i.e. three or four feet wide by three or four feet high or smaller, He begins working on ones for the most part that are over six feet high um, and that are anything from 12 to uh, 14 to to, uh, 20 feet wide. Um, And he's also using much thicker brushes or brushes with brushes with a much greater width. Magnification. uh, That's right. (laughs) But did it change the way you say magnified it? But he does say, doesn't he, towards the end in that period you're talking about where his eyesight was getting very poor. He says, my my poor eyesight makes me see everything in a complete fog. It's very beautiful all the same. And uh, uh, I'd love to have been able to convey this. 
That's right. He Well, there is no question that at certain points, especially 1923, 24, when he went into a very black depression, understandably because of his poor eyesight, he was affected by it at that point, and he virtually stopped painting simply because he could not convey it. The problem seems to have been color, uh, his problems with color, and also with judging what he painted, because he, um, after his operations, as I doctor told him, for an ordinary man, I have restored the sight, but for Claude Monet, who was known through a kind of sad irony at this point as having had the best vision in the history of art, said for Claude Monet, I cannot restore his eyesight. Ross King, biographer of Claude Monet. And that's it for today. You can call our action line for 24 hours after tonight's programme, the number 0800 044 or you can email in touch at bbc.co.uk or click on contact us on our website. And that's where you can also download tonight's In Touch and other previous editions. From me, Peter White, producer Lee Kumatat and the team, goodbye. Kumatat and the team, goodbye. Kumatat and the team, goodbye.